Praise God. Amen. Whom are all blessings flow. Amen. Again, we thank you, Brother Jay. Amen. For uh, helping us out on that. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Again, in the book of Mark, the eighth chapter, we have been, you know, traveling down this highway uh, this month talking about compassionate evangelism. Compassionate evangelism. Evangelism, you know, there's friendship evangelism, there is relationship evangelism, there is confrontational uh, evangelism, there is what's called uh, um, apologetic evangelism, where we get a systematic defense of the faith. There's, there are different methods and types of evangelism, but all that means nothing unless we involve compassionate evangelism. Jesus is the master teacher. He helps us to understand uh, the full import of compassion. He had to say a lot of things that were sometimes harsh, but he never uh, was without compassion. Amen. And I believe, I, I could be wrong on this, but I believe that as the church displays compassion, Amen. we'll find that our efforts will reap dividends and benefits to others. Right. So again, I, I want to say that uh, the Bible tells us uh, to be wise as serpents, right? right? But it also tells us to be harmless as doves. Right. And when you seek to be harmless as doves, as doves, uh, as doves you then will, will have empathy uh, toward others. You'll be uh, able to walk a mile in his shoes. Right. Right. Try to see the world through his lens that you may relate uh, and therefore effectively minister. Uh, to someone else. Amen. And so, uh, uh, I think it's important though, uh, that if we recognize opportunities and personnel for ministry, every day in your life, you will encounter opportunities for ministry. Well, Brother Mary, Brother I just didn't get a chance to minister. Whenever you have a conversation or interface with somebody else, Whenever you see somebody else, understand that, that is an opportunity for ministry. Mm -hmm. So no one can say, well, I just didn't get a chance to get out and, and really mingle amongst the populace today. Well, I'm not going for it. Because Jesus helps us to see that whatever we are doing, it doesn't matter how busy you are. We saw that when Jesus tried to get rest. And every time he saw rest, he found none. Why? Because the, the population was there. And he recognized. Amen. He had compassion toward. Amen. And he ministered to. I pray that we emerge from this message today. We will be more energized, more compelled uh, to engage in compassionate Amen. evangelism. Right. Notice we have to recognize opportunity and personnel, but Here's the fifth side of that. At the same time, we must discern those people and those situations that are determined to halt the Christian progress. Well. Don't think for one moment that everyone who comes to you has good intentions. I'm not trying to scare anyone. I'm not trying to get back or come back at somebody. No. Don't take my word for it. Ask Nehemiah. Yeah, there were some supposedly well-intentioned folk who said, Nehemiah, we got to have a meeting. We see what you're doing and we're impressed by your work and let's come and have a meeting and talk about how we can do this and that or whatever. And he said, you know what? Y'all can have a meeting. Y'all can check me down as an He said, I'm on this wall doing the work for the Lord and I cannot. I cannot come down. And so we all understand. And we have to be wise as serpents. In other words, don't allow someone or, or events and situations to thwart the progress of God. Yeah. Yeah. I want to show today that while, while the gospel must be preached to all, we must be careful mm -hmm. how we choose to spend our time mm -hmm. and how we choose to spend our energy. Sometimes we spend First rate energy on second rate things. Mm -hmm. Then when it's time, come time to do the good stuff, Amen. we tuck it out. Amen. We tie. 
we can have part of pittance mm. of labor and work to the Lord's business right. while we have consumed all of the time mm. on feeding the flesh. Mm. Yeah. Amen. There are some who God will reveal to you mm. as friends or as foes. Mm. Right. Oh yeah, he's going to reveal it. Yeah. Mm. The question is, do we have the spiritual discernment and the I care about it enough is <laughs> to heed the warning. Amen. And govern yourself accordingly. So my objective today is that, that we, we, we first guard uh, ourselves against the tendency to become spiritually blind through dark motives. I want to speak to me and I want to speak to you first and foremost because we don't have a message uh, for the masses. If we can't heed the message ourselves. So yes, Brother Mary, brother, uh, you may offend yourself today in this message. I need to get over it and get big enough uh, to get my feet out of the way if my feet get stepped on. And that goes true for you as well. Please receive what the Spirit of the Lord wants you to receive from this message on this morning. We must guard uh, against the influences of those who wish to do harm to the call of Christ. And so, this, this, this passage, we're only going to look at uh, verses 10 through 13. But 10 through 13 is, is couched in a larger context. And the context, Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. The leaven of the Pharisees. It's more than just the teaching of the Pharisees. Right. It is the permeating influence of the Pharisees, right. which can come not only in teaching, but in manner of life and in conduct and character and all those different things. Beware of the influence of those who want to uh, for God's progress and work in you. Amen. Notice uh, Notice in this text, Jesus has now crossed back over. Uh, he's come to the city that's near the city called Magdala, both of which are part of what we call the Decapolis district. We talked about that earlier, how Jesus had, had gone through uh, this region of the Decapolis, or the ten cities of that district. Uh, and we've already said that his adversaries seemed as though they were hot on his trail. We said that in chapter 7, uh, from Jerusalem, the scribes and Pharisees came down. Uh, in chapter 7, verse 1 through verse 9, the Pharisees came down looking for an occasion to uh, uh, befuddle him, to accuse him, to trap him, to accuse him of false motive and, and uh, ungodly character. And notice what they did. They looked around and they saw his disciples. Uh, uh, they had not washed their hands uh, and gone through the ceremonial cleansing before they ate. And they came with accusation. Why? The old disciples. So they, wouldn't, they couldn't marry up and say, why are you? They said, why are your disciples? Why are your disciples? Uh, Transgress the law of the elders by eating without going through the ceremonial washing. But we talked about what that meant. Sometimes you had a certain way you washed. This hand before this hand. You know, up to the elbows only. And, and you know, you had to hold the fist and do this, you know, make sure I got that washing. And all for show. All for ceremony. And, and, and Jesus said, you hypocrites. <laughs> Gino didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus said, you hypocrites. Why do you transgress the law of God uh, to maintain uh, these traditions, these man-made traditions? These, and, and we said that sometimes we give more anchor and more weight to tradition over the word of God. And he chastised them and rebuked them. And then, notice what happened. Because he had said this to those people who had garnered much respect from the people, the people began to kind of back up a little bit. Wait a minute. And he had called them to him. 
And he said, what goes uh, uh, into uh, the mouth is not what defiles the man, but what comes out. Because from what comes out, it comes from the heart. Right. Amen. Right. That's right. And then he said, we out of here. We out of here. And he got his disciples, and they went over to right on the border of the Gentile world, leaving almost Palestine and going to Tyre and Sidon to get some rest, uh, to prepare his people uh, for the cross that was coming, uh, to give them further instruction mm -hmm. and take a break and get away from those who were dogging his trail. Because right. yeah, his hour had not yet come. But as soon as he got over there, uh, we said that this Syrophoenician woman, yeah, 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 she came to Jesus, right? Remember that? She came to Jesus and, you know, begging Jesus uh, to please uh, have mercy on her and heal uh, her daughter who was deeming possessed, possessed with the devil. Sometimes we need to have lessons up in here. Possessed <laughs> <laughs> hey, with the devil. And notice when she came, then she, she, she pleaded, and, and it was a continuous plea, not this one time plea. She just continuously besought him. Right. And then the disciples said, send her away. And then he stepped in. Notice at first he didn't say anything. But he stepped in, and he said, you know what? It's not lawful to give uh, the bread of the children uh, to dogs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll be ready to cuss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll be ready to cuss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he didn't have a word. And notice, she, notice her comeback. Notice her comeback. She said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. But you need even, even the, the crumb that, that falls from the table. You know, they, the dogs eat that, don't they? Yeah. And we said the word dogs here was not the dogs, but uh, the word for those wild, ravenous packs who ran and you know, knocking over your trash can and you were back to home. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the ones who ran there to tear you up. No, this is like uh, the, the puppy, a little pet that is, is under the table. And, and then what's that thought? You wasted anyway. See, the Jews had wasted so much of God's blessing. And he said, you know, she said, even the dog eat what's that thought from the crumbs, from the table. And he, he ministered to her. And then, notice when he, he left the region of Siren and uh, and those two places, Tyre and Sidon, he came back, but he came back through the Decapolis, which is still a heavily populated Gentile region. It had Jews, but had a lot of Gentiles. How do we know that? Well, uh, remember in Mark uh, chapter 5, uh, 4 and 5, uh, when he came out of the boat and he landed in tombs, and this man was wild and crazy. He was demon possessed, and he ran and met Jesus. Remember that? And, and the Bible says he had legions of demons in him. Not just one, but multitudes. And, and, and Jesus cast the demon out, and then went into a herd of swine, and the swine committed suicide. See, they are lower and dumb animals. The first thing they could do when the devil got them to was to do what? Commit suicide immediately. See, the devil gets in us sometimes, we're a little higher being, right? And we commit suicide slowly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 some of you guys are <laughs> commit suicide slowly. <laughs> but notice the reaction to this man who was demon possessed, but now told in his right hand. He now has his sanity. He now is calm instead of uh, at war with anyone. They express their gratitude by saying, Could you please eat? <laughs> And if, 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 if it's not inconvenient, can you be out of town by sundown? Mm -hmm. He was banished from that area. And the man, however, notice the man. The man said, I want to follow you. See, when you get blessed, and you really get blessed, and you know you've been blessed, Amen. Amen. it changes your life. Amen. It changes your outlook on life. Amen. He said, can I go with you? Can I follow you? And Jesus said, no, you can't go with me, but you can go back home. Right. And tell everybody about the wonderful work that God has done in your life. And he went through after the Catholics, uh, heralding the good news of the gospel, the good news of what God had done in his life. Now, here we are today. He's come back through that region. And everyone uh, who heard the testimony of this man now hears that Jesus is in town. 4,000 folk came out. 
And for three days, they sit at the feet of Jesus hearing his teaching. As he fed them spiritually. And it came to a point where now it was time for them to go. And they had ran out of all their provision. And notice Jesus did something very, very powerful. He begins to teach by saying to his disciples. First of all, he said, I have compassion on them. But then he said, why? He said, because they've been with me these three days. And now they uh, have nothing. They're going back through the wilderness, going back home. Uh, and they will faint in the way. Mm-hmm. And then when the disciples said, well, you know what, I, I get it, but we ain't got nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, he, first of all, he said, first of all, the wilderness, there's nothing for them to, 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 to eat or to purchase in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. See, it's an excuse. The wilderness was an excuse. And then he says, and because the, the multitude is so large, right. the, the enormity of the, of, the, of the task was too large for us to do anything about it. Mm-hmm. In comparison to number three, we have meager provisions. Right. All those reasons why we can't sometimes in our life. Don't you come up with stuff and read why you can't do something. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> I can't get to work because I don't have a car. Mm-hmm. But you can get anywhere else you want to eat. Right. You need to call mom's house, or call big mom, or call somebody to get a ride. You get a ride with a time to do something that you want to take your phone but I don't want to get it all. It ain't in my love. <laughs> but the point is, he was teaching them. He said, no, what do you have? He said, I, we got seven loaves. They had a few fish. And you know, he says, bring the loaves to me. Notice what they had to do. They had to relinquish what they had. This is, this, is, this is a faith move here because sometimes you got money in your pocket. You got time on your hand that you refuse to relinquish. Right. That's why you can't get no blessing. Because <coughs> God wants to, to know, he took the bread and he broke it and he blessed it. Right. And gave it back to them for them to administer that to the people. But you see, they had to give to receive. There would have been no miracle. No multiplication of the resources had they not first given the meager. Right. Mm-hmm. And so today, mm-hmm. so today here we are. Um, we said that between that time and him coming back to this region that we're going to be dealing with back home, it was about six months. They needed that time. Right. And so now, notice what we find in our text. It says, I want to deal with starting verse number 11, where we talked about him, him okay, 10, he straightway, he, 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 he gets in the ship and he goes back through uh, the, uh, the Delmatum, uh, which is a city near Magdala, which is still a part of the 10, uh, the Decapolis, but he's coming back toward Galilee. He said, and the Pharisees came as soon as he got back. As soon as he got back, uh, the Pharisees came. In Matthew, said the Pharisees and the scribes. No, no, the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees, who were an enemy, by the way, had teamed up to accuse Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so, this, uh, in Mark, he says, he condenses it. He said, the Pharisees uh, came forth and began to question with him. <coughs> Seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. See, I want, the first thing I want to say today is, uh, and understand it, write this down. The spiritually blind saw a sign from heaven. The spiritually blind, they saw a sign. And a lot of times people get so caught up in, you know, uh, what do you hear God talk to the person in? You know, God told me this, and God told me that, and, and all that kind of stuff. You don't know what it could be too much indigestion, you ate too much carbohydrate, buttermilk, while you watch TV last night, and you had a stomach ache, and, and the head starts having these dreams. <laughs> I'm just making light of that. I don't mean to uh, offend, you know, one who has received the voice of God. I'm just trying to say we have to be wise and circus and harmless as those. There's a sharp difference. There's a sharp difference between uh, man's natural and spiritual senses. 
You see, his natural senses can be sharp and discerning, drawing conclusions from observation and experiences. Remember over in, in, in Matthew, Jesus, you know, he said, he, hypocrites. he said, you know what, how with it you can, you know, in the morning, uh, you look out and you see the sun is red. And, and then and you say it's going to be this kind of weather, that kind of weather. And you look out in the evening, you see the sun is red, and it means something else. He said, you can discern the weather, but you cannot discern the time. <laughs> you know, you can look at it and you can see with your natural eye, that's what he said. He said, you can see with your natural eye and make certain determinations. But you see, you're blind to the spiritual things that are going on around you. Amen. He said, well, you, you don't know the time that you're in, the condition that you're in. And therefore, you, you, you miss God Amen. because uh, man's spiritual senses are dead and need to be quickened and made alive by God. See, God is the one who discloses himself to man. We're going to say You see, the people of Jesus' day uh, had already received some signs. See, the book of John, John said uh, that many, 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 many miracles uh, Jesus did. They're not even written in the Bible. He said, but these have been recorded that you may uh, believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And through believing, uh, it will move you to life in his name. Right. So they had the people had signs. And not only did they live in critical times, uh, that's foretold of the coming of the Messiah. Remember, when Jesus was a baby, they took him to the temple. <laughs> they took him to the temple. I guess he's about eight days old, right? They took him to the temple. And there was one named Simeon. That's right. Who was there? And he, and he heard the baby crying. Everyone's going to take the baby out. <laughs> he heard the baby. And, and, and he, he looked and he saw the baby. And he began to praise God. He said, now, now that this whole weary, this whole weary man with this hard head and uh, feeble body, I can now go uh, and rest in peace. Because God told me I should not see death until... <laughs> The, 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 the redemption of Israel. Mm -hmm. And now when he saw Jesus, yeah. he said, I can now lay down, I can go to my grave in peace now. Because yeah. God had to feel his promise to me right. and allow me to see the deliverance of Israel right. and the right to the Gentiles Amen. in this little baby right here. Right. <laughs> right. See, the spiritual could see and discern the time. Yeah. A few verses later, in Luke chapter 2, 25 and following, by the way, uh, there was a woman named Anna. The Bible says she was a prophetess. Don't get scared of the word prophetess. She was a prophetess. And then she beheld yeah, Jesus. And she began to give prophecy about Jesus. Now, now, now wait a minute, now. He's going to be great. He's going to be delivered. But he's going to be like an arrow in your heart, Mary. And Mary and Joseph, they heard, they hear these things in their heart. The point Brother Mary was trying to make is you, you strive to live right and be a righteous person, God is going to reveal to you uh, through his providential handling of human affairs what side you ought to be on. The sign of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they had no excuse. Yeah. Even Daniel, you know, the weeks or the ages that were predicted by Daniel uh, that marked the closing out of that dispensation. Yeah, Daniel talked about the, the weeks or the ages, if you will, pointing to the clothing out uh, of this time and entrance into the time of Messiah. Elijah. Elijah was predicted to come back, and that prediction was fulfilled in John the Baptist. Yeah, and a forerunner, one who was to pave the way for Jesus. They had the signs. All they needed to do was to recognize the signs. Uh, Jesus being born in Bethlehem was also a prophecy that was fulfilled. And they even knew about it. Remember the Magi of the three wise men? Right. We three kings of Orient. Uh, the Magi from distant lands, they even were aware that something was going on. They knew that the Christ or a Christ would come. Some deliverer would come. And they came. And Herod knew what he could. He could solve it with those religious folk. And they pinpointed the, the city, the time, all that kind of stuff. Right. And Herod, instead of rejoicing, tried to have him killed. Right. Mm -hmm. right. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even the words and the works of Jesus were or, or, or cost, um, substantiation of who he was. All of his claims. In other words, the people of that generation had signs. So why do you ask this for a sign? But before we get too strong on the people of that day, what about today? Huh? Are you ready, ready to have so much? See, that's why we have all those faith healers and all those, you know, faith healers and, and all that kind of stuff. Right. They want you to send some money in, and and, and they give you this little piece of wood. That was a little, this little piece of toothpick, which was the original wood they used in the ark. <laughs> it was the original wood that was the cross that Jesus died on. Yeah. Have enough, enough wood in their soul to build a whole apartment complex. But this is the wood that came off of the cross. Be careful. You be careful. But this day, uh, this generation, uh, we have signs as well. What about the natural marvels? Man denies the creation. The Bible says over in the book of Psalm 19. That creation uh, uh, declare the handiwork of God. And while the creation speaks out and screams out about God, man denies the creator. Uh, the, the, the creation that points to the creator. And not only that, uh, the privileged life. Some folks, you have to understand you've been blessed. Mm -hmm. You've been blessed. Amen. And, and God has given you privilege. Mm -hmm. uh, the beauty of the world, the daily mercies and benefits that you receive. Mm -hmm. Man attributes that to natural happenings. Mm -hmm. Man will attribute that to the laws of nature, uh, uh, humanistic ability. Or the evolutionary process. Whatever they can do to rob God of the glory and give it back to themselves. The Old Testament, uh, men, uh, men can appreciate the, a lot of the teachings and the history of the Old Testament while at the same time uh, rejecting the promise, the prophetic promises that are being fulfilled in Jesus. Salvation is rejected for man to be able to put himself up by his own bootstraps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even consciousness. Do you not know when we do certain things wrong, we feel guilty? Mm -hmm. right. God has given us a consciousness mm -hmm. of sin. You want to you rip somebody off, you want to steal, break in their house, and you come home after you, you know, with your loot, and you come in and you find somebody, broke in your house, first thing you want to do is get that. Yeah. You know within yourself, right. God has given you a consciousness right. of sin. Right. But man would deny that. Death and resurrection of Jesus uh, is something that is a historical fact, uh, verified, substantiated, and validated by eyewitnesses, while man continues uh, to reject and dismiss that. Amen. Why? Because. There is what I call the responsibility of faith. The responsibility of faith. See, if you accept Jesus as Messiah, that means you have to submit to him as Lord, as Master. Yeah, I want him to be my Savior. But I'm not all interested in him being my Lord. See, that's why it's easy to reject. Because to accept brings responsibility right. of you transforming your life. Amen. So we can't come up in the church talking about, oh, how I love Jesus, and continue to have a life that says, I'm a practicing atheist. Amen. Amen. I'm a professing Christian. Amen. But I'm a practicing atheist Amen. in my conduct, in my character, Amen. in how I display myself before others. Right. Amen. Therefore, they asked for a sign. <laughs> they asked for a sign. Notice more specifically, however, they asked for a sign from heaven. In other words, all these earthly things that you've done, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, you know, making the man walk and casting out death, all those things, he, they, those were approvable and observable. But those weren't good enough for them. Uh, they wanted a sign from heaven. 
They want to see, you know, hear the thunder roll and the lightning flash and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, he, yeah, that's why Satan said to Jesus back there in Matthew chapter 4. Uh, he said, you know, if you be the son of God, won't you get on the highest pinnacle of the temple? And just jump down. And as you're coming down, ah, everybody see that. And then the angels will not allow your feet to be dashed by the sun, right? And they'll come and swoop you up so everybody can see. Exhibitionism. And guess what? If they receive the sign, they see what the Lord See, you know, remember when John the Baptist baptized Jesus and a sign from heaven came? Right. What were you? The Bible said uh, uh, a voice from heaven came out as the dove, the spirit of God, as the dove descended on him. A voice came, and this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. What were you then? Mm -hmm. On the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, Moses and Elijah came, and the Bible said the cloud came over them, and, 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 and the disciples over there, the disciples over there, they beheld this glorious event. Let's see again for a sign. I just want to say this. I want to say this. While they were so caught up in the spectacular and sensational, uh, they wanted a sign of their own choosing. In other words, all these other signs are not good enough. Jesus, I want something more. See, they wanted a sign of their own choosing. See, God's, uh, God's concerned with meeting people where they are. These signs that Jesus was, were, was engaged in <clears throat> have to validate compassionate evangelism. I can, I can, I can do this spectacular thing. And everybody's impressed. But nobody is blessed. Right. Are you feeling me? Yeah. yeah. You know, they can be impressed, but no blessing from that. Mm -hmm. Jesus was, was, was engaged in lifting up, hurting humanity. He was engaged in meeting needs. Right. Uh, where those needs were. Mm -hmm. And so, this unbelief and this blindness was a self-inflicted blindness. And self-inflicted blindness exists today. There are many who just can't hear the truth. They've been blinded by error. And they can't hear the truth. Self-inflicted blindness. Just look around and you see a compromised church. We might say we're going to talk to ourselves first. We're a compromised church because we can't see. And we are engaged in self-blindness. They have been blinded by traditions. Uh, blinded by power. Uh, blinded by selfish motives. Jesus felt both grief as well as indignation from the bottom of his heart. Notice what the Bible watch this. You go like this. It says here, um, <laughs> he sighed deeply in his spirit. <clears throat> Have you ever had to sigh deeply in your spirit? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> he sighed deeply in his spirit. Mm -hmm. It's almost as though he was saying, you know, how long mm. do I have to put up with this? Mm. Have you ever like mm. <sighs> He sighed. Because the reason why men are spiritually blind is because of their motives. Mm. These men were not seeking truth. Amen. They tried to trap him. So when they came to Jesus, before they even came to the table, it was for the reason uh, of ulterior, uh, demonic motives. These questions, 
the answer to the question would not have moved them. They were trying to trap Jesus. Mm -hmm. They were trying to catch him in some kind of slip of the lip. No, 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 no. These men were trying to trap him. They were trying to discredit him uh, before the crowd. That they might even have cause to accuse him of blasphemy and therefore stone him to death. And to that, he said, aside. And he says, why does this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. In Matthew, Matthew a little bit more, you know, put my thumb on it kind of, kind of. He said, you hypocrites, this wicked generation seeking after a sign. And there will be none given except for of the sign of Jonah, the prophet. Let me give this to you. Number two, the spiritually blind, they grieve the Lord and receive no sign. He was grieved. When he sighed, he was grieved. But also, he had an indignation toward them. There's nothing wrong with a righteous indignation. That does not give you guys license to just be indignant. Right. But a righteous indignation. Right. It's kind of like when Jesus observed those money changes in the temple. Mm -hmm. And they were making, you know, commerce and marketing, you know, and, and cheating people all in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And he had a righteous indignation. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what he did? See, that's why I like Jesus. He took a whip. <laughs> and he chased those jokers out of there. Nothing wrong with, you know, getting your dandruff up for the right reasons. And so Jesus, he told them, this generation who seeks a sign, uh, who wants God to show off, you know, and that's not going to move you because your hearts are already dark. It is never going to get one. No, it's right there. Uh, there was no excuse for the blindness. See, what is said of the religionists of Jesus' generation can also be said to every generation of unbelievers, including the one in which we live. Yeah, unbelievers do not receive signs from the Lord. But believers do. The believers do. Notice, there was no excuse for the blindness. They had evidence after evidence. These were religious folk who chose to live for themselves rather than to live for God. Amen. That's what you want to know what this is really all about? This is what the power play. Let's go ahead and stick the, take the gloves off and lose my voice. <clears throat> <clears throat> With the cough drop in your ear. But again, uh, this is the power play. Because Jesus was coming in and he was upsetting the outer court. He was changing people's hearts and minds. And it was being to expose the religionists of the day for who and what they really were. Right. That's why they said they had to take him out. That's why they tried to discredit him. And if you come up trying to do something real, genuine, and authentic for the Lord, folk will try to discredit you. Right. Amen. Minimize your progress. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they were for themselves. But not only that, let me give you quickly seven reasons why no signs were given. Number one, uh, they chose, they chose spiritual blindness. They refused to look at the signs of the times. All the prophecies about Jesus. Uh, they were unjustified in seeking additional signs uh, uh, to show them the Messiah. Why? See, God is not so much interested in the signs. God is interested in love and truth. Amen. And they had already determined that whatever you show us, it won't be enough. You can, you can, you can break dance on this pulpit. Yeah, let me show you what I mean. <laughs> That's another sermon. <laughs> whatever you do, it won't be good enough. They've already made up their mind. This is who we are. This is what we're about. Uh, 
They failed to see God uh, in his work. And they did not want to believe uh, because they were obstinate. They were fixed in unbelief. They had forsaken the true God to serve uh, the God of the spectacular, the God of sensationalism. They wanted a sign of their own choosing. We said that, right? Uh, so therefore, the bottom line is, Jesus felt both grief and sorrow and pain, and he was downright mad. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we look at Jesus as though he was just, you know, dripping in piety every, every, every day, every moment. Mm -hmm. But I like Jesus because Jesus, you know, there's some stuff he didn't like. Right. He didn't let you know. Mm -hmm. He said, you hypocrites, and you're not getting nothing from me. And then let me give you my last point, and that's when we'll be yours. Not only do we see the spiritually blind salt a sign from heaven, the spiritually blind also grieve the Lord and therefore receive no sign. But also, and this was a dangerous one, guys, the spiritually blind were and will be rejected by Jesus. That's what it boils down to. You can be blind all you want. But notice the final verse of the text. After Jesus had said, no sign will be given to this generation, he left. <laughs> As it. Verse 13 says, and he left them, entered into the ship, and departed to the other side. Now what's the big deal with that? What is the significance of that. Well, uh, well, he left them. See, they were determined to be his enemies. They were determined to be uh, adversarial. Sometimes you got to leave some folk. Sometimes you can't give a lot of time and attention to folk. Folk want you to dance to their music. They want you to show some, some, some grand exhibition and do what uh, they want you to do. Mm -hmm. You got to be wise as serpent. Harvest as dove now. But you've got to be wise as perfect. Right. He said, I ain't got time for this foolishness. Right. He said, I'm getting back in. Fellas, ho, <laughs> let's get back in the boat. Yeah. And he left them. Right. See, he had no choice. Right. He had no choice but to leave them. Why? Do you, you don't cast your pearls before swine. Mm -hmm. You don't give, you know, good stuff to those who don't want it. He said, I'm not even going there with you, fellas. Hmm. So sometimes he found himself having to argue with them, debate with them. He said, you know what? I'm done. Right. And he departed from, he left them. See, uh, the decision was really theirs. Right. It wasn't Jesus that said, I'm just going to leave you, I'm going to hold my love back from you and all that. No, Jesus had no choice. Their decision, see, when one's heart it's dark. You can't see the light. Mm -hmm. <laughs> see, spiritual blind, well, physical, physical blindness mm -hmm. is not the absence of light. Physical blindness is one's inability to see the light. Mm -hmm. Did y'all get that? Mm -hmm. We can walk out of that if I am physically blind. I don't care how much the sun is shining, I still can't see. Spiritually, when you are spiritually blind, you can't see the light of Jesus. God is the one who has to lift the scales. And sometimes, because of your obstinance, because of your rebellion, because of your hardness of heart, you, you fix your, you dig in and fix your position. And your fate. And so George Floyd, he left them. Uh, he had no choice because the decision was already made by them. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Throughout our lives, folks, throughout your life, mm -hmm. we can be guilty of believing Jesus. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, we need Jesus a lot, don't we? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, you, when, you, when you put Jesus over to your side and go and do whatever else sinful stuff is, mm -hmm. and 
you, you leave Jesus, right? And then when it's convenient, you may come back and get him. But when Jesus leaves you, we are all to be most pitied. Don't let Jesus say I'm done with you. And I'm leaving you because of your hardness of heart. Right. Jesus said, if, you, if you're weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not rejecting anyone. But when you reject me, you tap my hands. And in this situation, these folk who had already determined, I don't care what you do, Jesus. Mm -hmm. See, when they ask for a sign of heaven, from heaven, you know that? Why did they do that? Because they didn't expect one. <laughs> they didn't want one. If they got it, they were going to do anything with it. See, Jesus was able to discern their spirit. You need to be able to discern what's going on around you. Don't you be guilty of leaving Jesus. For in consequence, Jesus may just have to leave you. There may be some of you here today. Your life has challenged you. You begin to waver in your faith. And you begin to question why you're even here. You begin to question the very veracity of God's love for you. The realness of your faith. And you begin to allow other influences come into your life. Such a point that you begin to reject and blaspheme God. Leaving Him. See, God is not slack in his promises. It's some kind of slackness. Mm -hmm. But he gives us all space and time to come to repentance. Mm -hmm. But you know, you have so much space and so much time. Mm -hmm. Don't make God have to leave you. God wants you to come to him by acknowledging, first of all, who he is. He is indeed Messiah. Right. He, is the, he, is, he is the one who's able to give you life. Amen. Right. The Bible says, uh, the scepter. Uh, should not depart from Judah. In other words, the lawgiver. The lawgiver came out of the tribe of Judah. Of nothing they missed. If you're here today and you want to come to him, not run for him, but come to him. Right. You do that by acknowledging that you're not worthy to be in the presence of the Lord. So it's an act of humility to come to the Lord. It's understanding that he is indeed the Christ. And that he loved you so much that he died for you. Right. He was buried and rose again on the third day. Mm -hmm. And how do you appropriate the benefits of his death to your life? Right. It's how to obey in the gospel. Right. When you hear the word of uh, who he is and what he's done for you, it should move you. The love of God will move us to what we call repentance. A decision to want to turn from your way and now run to him. Confessing that he is Lord. And being buried in the watery grave of baptism for the remission of your sins. Amen. And you should receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, it's the gospel. Mm -hmm. I don't know who you are, where you are in your life, but this is your moment. Will you come to Him or will you run <coughs> from Him? Yes. Will you open the door when He tries to come to you or will He have to reject you and go to someone else? Mm -hmm. Think about that. If you're here today and you need prayer for whatever reason, if you're here today, you need to give your life to Christ. Mm -hmm. Whatever your issue, make that decision now. I'm going to ask that we begin to sing softly. And I want our Brother Murphy, if you will, to come up. And if anyone needs prayer, our brother, brother, uh, Friday, you can be on this side. If you need to come up, you need prayer for whatever's going on in your life. Hey, brother, we're here. Think about it together. We stand and sing a song of encouragement.